Hello and welcome to another edition of Quest for Truth. This is episode 15. We are going to jump right in to Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. Last time we left off looking at the different churches, we got as far as the church of Sardis. And now we want to pick up in Philadelphia. Hey Rob, it's great to see you. Yeah, great to see you too. I uh, just want to, before we begin, I want to point our uh, viewers to our website, uh, questfortruth.net. People may not be aware that we actually have a website, and we talk about it sometimes, and it's at the, at the end of our uh, show. We've got a little tagline there, but uh, sometimes we are able to put notes at, after our show. Uh, our episodes are all right here on the left-hand side. If you go to our website, questfortruth.net, Actually, uh, before I do that, I want to show you something, too. Uh, just added conferences to the website last night. Uh, so we've got a couple of conferences coming up. And, Doug, if you've got some other ones, let me know. But I've got one coming up in Lubbock, Texas, in December, 13th, 14th, and 15th, Ancient Mysteries of the Bible, Sons of God, Giants of Old. I'll be sharing the stage with Dr. Judd Burton, uh, Dr. Aaron Judkins, and Joe Taylor uh, there in December. And then we've got the Prophecy Forum coming up, and I'll let you take that. Uh, tell our, our viewers uh, about uh, what's coming up in February. Yeah, you know, uh, Gons Shimur and I, Gons is the producer of Age of Deceit, been a very popular uh, movie online on YouTube. And uh, we've put together this conference. Uh, we're, we, we call ourselves uh, Prophecy Forum, and we're putting on Decoding the End Times. Uh, it's, a, it's a conference that's going to take place in Westminster, California, and it will be February 21st and 22nd. Uh, everyone's invited. Uh, you can get your tickets on the website. Uh, you know, something like this uh, easily can cost $100. I mean, I've been to conferences where they charge $99 or something like that, and sometimes even more. Um, we we wanted to uh, really keep this affordable, and so the early bird special is fifteen dollars, and the, the regular uh, after the first hundred tickets are sold uh, is thirty dollars. So you know that's to uh, of course help pay for all the speakers and just all the different things that go with it. And we want to keep doing this in the future. So we're hoping to maybe put on two conferences a year, uh, God willing. So uh, we'd love to see people come out. It's always great to put a uh, a name with a face, and uh, again, it'll be here in Southern California. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, L.A. Marzulli is going to be there. Of course, you're going to be there. Gon Shimura from uh, the uh, Canary Cry Radio, Basil and Gons, they're going to be there. Bill Salas, Doug Krieger, uh, and Brian Gottawa. So uh, it looks like a really fun lineup of uh, speakers. Looking forward to joining everybody out there in February. And uh, now going back to our website. Uh, like I said, our episodes are in the archive shows category there. You can go through each one of them, and sometimes, like last week, uh, there are additional notes. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of notes that, that uh, added to the show that we did uh, last time regarding the Holy Spirit, and um, I have to say I was pretty excited about finding out that uh, E.W. Bullinger was saying a lot of the same things that I was discovering just from the scriptures. I had come to my conclusions just looking at the scriptures for myself, uh, and after uh, forming my views and stuff uh, and, and getting into a lot of Facebook debates, uh, Facebook friends said, hey, have you seen what Bullinger had to say about that? And I'm like, no. And, uh, you know, Bullinger is a, a well-respected theologian, and apparently he was saying and writing about a, a lot of the same things that I was discovering about a hundred years ago. <laughs> so uh, I've put a bunch of notes there for people to check out and uh, we'll try to keep uh, keep uh, that sort of thing going on with our website uh, as we're able to do so. Uh, and, and Doug, if you've got some thoughts, you can add to things as well. But just want our, our viewers and our listeners to know that there's more than just the videos. So if they want to keep on studying these subjects, uh, sometimes we add those to the uh, show page on our website. Yeah, and we just want to let people know that uh, we also are delighted to come and share the various things that we've discovered in God's Word uh, with uh, a conference or a church. Uh, it's just always a joy when we get to go and, and see people and uh, to share uh, the things that uh, God has for has uh, shown us. And so, um, you know, feel free to, to give us a call or send us an email, and we, we'd love to interact with you in that way. 
Absolutely. Well, you know, people always are like, when are you going to come to the East Coast or when are you going to come to the Northeast or whatever? I'm like, when you invite me. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's about the same with you. Uh, we'll go anywhere uh, we're invited to go. So uh, if you'd like us to come speak, give us a call or send us an email. We'd love to We'd love to speak with your church or your audience. Yeah, usually we just need a plane ticket. That's about that's a, yeah, in a, in a in a warm place to sleep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's all we require. So yeah. Well, hey, let's jump in now to Revelation chapter three. Uh, I'll read it and we'll get it started here. So Revelation three seven to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write these things: who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. And no one can shut it, for you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews, but are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you, because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast. To what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Oh boy, there's a lot of exciting stuff in there, Rob. I don't know yeah, where there to start. is. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I'll. I'll point something out that jumped out at me right away, and I don't have the answer to this, so I'm going to run this one by you. Uh, in verse uh, 7, where it says, uh, of course, addressing the Church of Philadelphia, but then it says, uh, these things says he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David. What is the key of David? Mm. Well, you know, a key is something that you can open and close with. It's a symbol of authority. Uh, you know, there. I don't think there's any uh, particular structure that is going to be opened, but the key is the object or instrument by which you have the authority to open and close. Uh, here, the key of David, uh, as I would understand it, is referring to the fact that Jesus is the one who is the is the seed of David. He has therefore the right to the Davidic throne and uh, you know this is this is a a, a, a re summarization of who Jesus is he has the key of David or the authority uh, of the the kingdom of David he can you know quite uh, he, he's worthy to sit on the throne he's also the one who opens and no one shuts and he shuts and no one's opens so he has that kind of authority he has that kingly authority uh, because of that key. So, uh, you, you know, I know we both believe, that, I mean, we, we both take the scriptures literally. Is this a metaphor or is this something physical? Is this a, a, a literal key? Is well, there something such as, the, I mean, a little, something known as the key of David that... Um, the people who John was writing to would have been familiar with. Well, you know, we also have in Revelation 1.18, uh, Jesus says that I have the keys of death and Hades. Yeah. Uh, when I think of a key, you know, I mean, when we say when we say literal, I mean, we're talking like a piece of metal that you put into a wooden door. Is that what we mean by key? Right. Well, I don't know. I mean, is that what a literal key is? Uh, if you've ever bought software, uh, you have to put in a key into your software to make it work, uh, but it doesn't doesn't it's not comprised of a piece of metal, uh, but it's actually a, a series of numbers and letters that you have to put into the the computer to make that software operate. So we use keys all the time, but I think the the key that we're thinking of is you know what we're used to this old kind of key, but I don't think that's the only kind of key. Just as we talked about what a door is. Uh, a door is is not simply some pieces of wood on a hinge, but um, it's any kind of a gateway between two different places. And well, I guess the reason I'm asking that is because I do believe what you're saying is true, uh, certainly. But there, 
was apparently a key of Solomon that was a very literal thing. I mean, there's lots of stuff people can look up in that regard. So I'm just wondering, you know, the key of Solomon, a lot of people talk about that in reference to uh, Kabbalah and controlling demons, uh, having the ability to uh, control demons. There's an awful lot of stuff out there on the key of Solomon. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just wondering if there was actually something perhaps comparable to that that was considered the key of David that was very specific to opening and closing. And what exactly does opening and closing doors mean in, in uh, chapter 3, verse 7? Right. Well, you know, in Isaiah 22, 22, uh, he talks about, um, he says, uh, I'll start in verse 20, Then it shall be in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your belt. I will commit your responsibility into his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to the house of J David, oh, excuse me, Judah, the key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder, so he shall open and no one shall shut, and he shall shut and no one shall open. Mm. So that's the exact passage that we have in Revelation 3.7. Very good. You know, I, I yeah. love this because we've said it before, uh, the New Testament is not written in a void. So I've maintained, and I haven't found every instance, but I've maintained that when we see something in the New Testament, there's... There's, there's precedence for it in the Old Testament. Yes. And I don't know if that's a blanket statement for everything, but so far i found that it pretty much is. That it's, yeah. uh, I, th I think you yeah. said it. The New Testament is commentary on the uh, Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. Exactly. Yeah, you know, there may be you know, a couple of lines here and there that we don't find, but, but almost everything has already been said once or even twice. I mean, it's by the, it's by two, the mouth of two or three witnesses that a matter is established. Oh, I'm glad you said that. Uh, yeah. Actually, w one of my detractors came after me because of that. He said, well, that's only in reference to, you know, if you're going to stone somebody to death or something. I said, no, it's a principle in Scripture that's yeah. listed multiple times. It's, I forget how many times. I've got it in one of my uh, DVD presentations. I show how many times it's listed. It, the, the precedence is that you need more than one person to establish truth. It's not just to, to convict a murderer. It, the principle is you have to be able to establish truth at the mouth of at least two witnesses. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, I, I call it uh, biblical triangulation. You know, yeah, like, I like that. <laughs> you have your, 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 your cell phone, you have at least three towers. Uh, yeah. Maybe even two you could kind of triangulate, but not very accurately. With yeah. at least three towers, you can triangulate your position very well. Uh, and the more towers you have, the more precise the triangulation. And so I think of the different verses uh, like those towers that you have, you know, let's take a particular doctrine and you have these different verses, you can sort of put them in a circle and in, in the center where the hub is, that is your core doctrine. And so the more verses you have that talk about that, the same topic, maybe a little bit different language, but the same topic, you put those together and you say, wow, that's, that's pretty powerful uh, that, um, you know, now we have a doctrine that you can really stand on. You know, that's why, for example, this whole thing, like, you know, the Mormons, they do with their uh, baptizing of the dead. I mean, you know, they're you know they're taking that out of context, first of all. Uh, mm -hmm. Secondly, there's only one reference to uh, that. And, and, and it has nothing even to do with, you know, going in and dip for somebody else. It, it actually has to do with uh, really wa the washing of the body for a dead person uh, mm -hmm. in, in preparation for the resurrection in case people are wondering what that's all about. But, yeah. you know, the Mormons have gone way off on this whole thing. And, see, they can only find one verse to substantiate that. So they've created this this whole system, this, this incredibly crazy religious system where they have to go and be baptized pro by proxy for all their dead relatives. Now, it makes them great at doing genealogy searches uh, for what it's worth. Uh, but, you know, they think they're actually going to go and, you know, get Uncle Joe out of uh, hell, basically, uh, by being baptized for him. It's just, it's really quite nonsensical. But, yeah. um, you know, yeah, everything is, is by two or three witnesses. So here in, in Isaiah 22, you got the same exact language, the key of the house of David. What is it saying? Well, that, that uh, Eliakim is going to have the authority 
and he will be able to open and no one will shut and he can shut and no one can open. Uh, so it's talking about that Davidic authority that God is going to give, in this case, in Isaiah 20, uh, 22, to Eliakim. In the case of Jesus, of course, uh, he now, all that has been conferred upon Jesus and nobody else. Mm, yeah, that's some good stuff. Yeah, definitely. I've, uh, make, I'm making some notes on that one for sure. Uh, okay, so, yeah, I mean, that's a that's a direct quote. I mean, he who opens and no one shuts, that John's writing about that. I never saw that before, but, uh, yeah, that's right there in Isaiah 22. Yeah, um, and, you know, and, of course, we have Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 that, um, you know, this is the classic passage we hear at Christmas time. Uh, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulder, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order and establish it with judgment and justice from the time, from that time forward, for even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So, again, just more confirmation of who Jesus actually is. Fantastic. Uh, okay, so then we keep looking. I'm going to put this up here on the screen, back to uh, Revelation chapter 3. Uh, probably no need to really go into this any further, but uh, verse we 9. About, yeah, yeah, we talked about the synagogue of Satan. The sa- yeah. yeah, just for people who want to know, it, we, we covered that, I think, pretty well in episode 11. There's a bunch of notes there and other videos and books and stuff people can check out on the website on that one right there. Right, But yeah. uh, do you have anything else you wanted to add to uh, no, that issue? No, not really, not really. Uh, verse 10 uh you know, he says, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to oh. test those who dwell on the earth. Now, hmm. again, you and I, have, uh, I think we're in agreement on this. <laughs> you know, part of the, the whole context of our show is that we, we disagree on quite a few things. But, you know, we actually agree on a lot, too. I think and, we agree uh, on more. We, we agree on more <laughs> than we disagree. <laughs> yeah. Oh no! What are we gonna do? We just I don't know. Oh, the show's over with. Forget <laughs> show's it. Show's over if we agree too much. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know that's just where iron sharpens iron, and where you know if we if we are on a quest for truth, which I am, I'm on a quest for truth. I know you are yes, as well. Right. Sure. It doesn't really matter what that truth is, because if it's true, then then you can't argue with it, right? Uh, you know, I mean, I remember years ago, uh, somebody asked me the question. They're like, "Well, if I could prove the Bible wasn't true, would you still believe it?" And I didn't know what to say back then. I was young and experienced, and I was just holding on to my faith. Uh, you know, today, being a little bit more mature, uh, I would say, "Yeah, absolutely. I'd completely abandon the Bible if you could prove to me that it's not true. Uh, no problem whatsoever. I, I'd, I'd stop believing in God if you could prove to me that He's not true." Uh, right, you know, I mean, look, if, if, if that's the truth, then forget it. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to continue on with the charade. Uh, but if it is true, you know, I should have asked him at that point, uh, would you uh, renounce what you're doing and, and believe in God? But I suspect he would have said no. That so often is the case. Uh, but we just want to know what, it, what really is. What is reality? Whatever reality is, is fine with me. I'll take it because you can't change reality. So, uh, you know, here we have this hour of trial that will come upon the whole world. To me, this does sound like it's talking about the end times, even though, you know, as I was saying, we don't see these churches as church ages. Like, there isn't a church age called the, the age of the Church of Philadelphia. But these are true of churches that are this way. It's true of individuals as well that are this way, that that are... Uh, you know, people that are faithful, uh, they have uh, continued. And, of course, you know, we, we don't want to undermine the fact that there really was a church known as the Church of Philadelphia, and, um, you know, Jesus was speaking to them. But there's a lot of application for the rest of us. If you happen to find yourself as someone like the Church of Philadelphia, Philadelphia great, continue. And here's a promise. If you, you know, because you've kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, uh, this raises a, a whole different question, doesn't it, Rob? Well, yeah, and this one I don't think is, is a, another scripture. It's not written in the void either, um, and, and it may actually tie into the previous statement 
regarding those who say they are Jews but are not, and some of the things we talked about in uh, Quest for Truth episode 11. Uh, it, at that time, I thought there was only one in gathering, and I was looking at the scriptures and saying, "Man, 1948 doesn't doesn't fit," you know, Isaiah 66, 8, and all the scriptures usually used for it. Uh, in, until I had been turned on to the works of um, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, uh, and he made me aware that there are actually two in gatherings: one in unbelief and one in belief. And both of those verses in Revelation chapter three may tie into Zephaniah two. Uh, Zephaniah 2 talks about them gathering themselves together, O oh, undesirable nation. I believe that's what, personally, I believe that's what happened in 1948. Uh, you can go ahead and read the rest of that, uh, Zephaniah 2, 1 and 2. But then it says in verse 3, Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Uh, I believe that may be a, a direct correlation to that verse that we're looking at right there in uh, Revelation 3.10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I do believe that that's a prophetic reference to uh, the last days and what we call the tribulation period. And so the key uh, to surviving that is to seek the Lord and to uh, obey him and to, I would say, you know, in, in my own words, get on his page. <laughs> yes. Well, what does it mean to persevere? I mean, what's up with that? Well, uh, I, I think that's related to overcoming. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, he says over and over and over again about uh, overcomers, and I, I I maintain you can't be an overcomer unless you have something to overcome, and to overcome something is to per persevere, to go through it, to endure it, you know, to come out on top. Right. Well, there's plenty to persevere. Jesus promised that we would have tribulation in this world. Um, you know, is it is it just to keep on fighting the good the good fight as a as a believer, or or, or is there something? Do you see it as something more? Maybe there isn't anything there. I don't know. Well, I, that's enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, I mean, we we in America don't really experience it, but right. ha having been a missionary in in restricted access countries, those people are persevering through much trial and tribulation and persecution. Hmm. Um, you know, it's holding fast to the things that we believe in, in spite of all that. That I would say is is what's being written about here is in terms of persevering and we see in verse 12 he who overcomes uh, so I, that's my take on it anyway that's what I believe is taking place there yeah well fair enough and so we do see that in reference to the tribulation um, now from the hour of trial um, I'm also a stickler for uh, for literal interpretation uh, we have another place in the book of Revelation where it talks about an hour, and it's talk. It's there in Revelation 17, and you have those other kings that will give their power and authority hmm. uh, for one hour as kings with the beast. Now you might say, well, you know, maybe this is just uh, nothing more than, um, you know, talking about a phrase of time. Uh, you know, and I, I can't be absolutely sure here, but it does say one hour. It does say that in the Greek. It says one hour. And I believe that the time units uh, actually have meaning. I don't think that they're just, you know, hodgepodge and, you know, over here it's this. You know, a day can be whatever you want it to be, and a year can really mean a century or something like that. Hmm. Uh, I, I've seen that, that days are always days. In fact, a day is is always uh, one revolution of the earth uh, on its axis, uh, which is generally a 24-hour day. I mean, I think in the case of Joshua's long day, it got a bit longer, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, with those minor exceptions, uh, and, of course, the day that Jesus comes back, it's going to be a little bit longer than 24 hours. It'll be a long day, it says in Habakkuk, that uh, the sun and the moon will stand still in their habitation. But, you know, barring those uh, those notable exceptions. Um, you know, I, I see that a day is a day, a year is a year. Uh, when it says a thousand years that Satan would, will be put away, I, I, I don't see any reason to say that that's, you know, again, some long indefinite period of time. And, no, a thousand is really a thousand. A year is really a year. And um, so what about the word hour? Well, it does get a little bit trickier because we do have 
uh, references uh, to, for example, it says that Jesus says that his hour has not yet come. Um, you know, it, you know that uh, there there are these references to the word hour, and you know, trying to discern those uh, and to understand. Uh, however, let me just go on and just to uh, kind of give some some context here. We have another number of places. For example, in Matthew chapter eight, verse thirteen. Uh, Jesus says to the centurion, go your way as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And this, his servant was healed that same hour. So there's the word ora in Greek. Uh, it's the same exact word, ora. Uh, then we have a woman that was made well from that hour. That's Matthew 9.22. Again, it's the same Greek word, ora. Um, and we have a number of places where the word hour is being used. Uh, where it's just being used as a regular hour. And that makes me think that when we're talking about, um, you know, this word, that it really does mean an hour. Uh, you have also the parable of the uh, the men that uh, that worked all day, and then one some people came and they worked just for one hour, it says. And he talks about all these, this first hour, second hour, etc. Again, each one of these is a real hour. It's not some uh, you know, indefinite period of time. And even when Jesus says, but of the day and hour, no one knows. That's why I think it's important to keep the word hour, meaning really just an hour. Now, there may be some places where the word hour is being used, and we don't quite understand what it means. Could it be uh, used more in a figurative sense well, you know, again, I, I have not gone through the entire Bible to look at all the places where the word hour is being used. And, you know, I'm sure someone could bring up uh, some kind of an exception and say, well, what about this, you know? Um, but I'm just going to go out on a limb a little bit here and uh, say when it's talking about hour, it has to do with 60 minutes. And, you know, there may be, you know, sort of, the time leading up to that hour and, of course, after that, that it's all part of this grand thing. Let's take the the ten kings that will give their power to the beast for an hour. Uh, you'd say, well, gee, an hour is not much time to get anything done. Well, we don't know exactly what they're going to do in that hour. We don't know what it means to give their power and authority to the beast for an hour. Uh, maybe an hour is actually enough time to accomplish uh, what needs to happen. Maybe it's the it's the transference of power that takes place in an hour. Uh, there, there may be things that we just don't quite understand, but what I want to get to, I don't want to get too long-winded here, but an hour is an hour in my book. And I, I believe that's what the Bible is actually talking about. An hour is actually 60 minutes. And there may be places we don't get it, but again, I maintain that an hour is, in fact, 60 minutes. Well, here's a, I would agree with that, except that I, I've often wondered about the context of that hour in in time and space uh, because John is in heaven at this point so I've often wondered if we're on God time or if we're on human time and uh, you know if I go with the scripture literally where it says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and I was desperately trying to find it while you were talking but I think my chart is on a different on my laptop Second I've got Peter a, 3 uh, verse uh, 9 yeah, I well, I have a I have an Excel spreadsheet that figures time out based on that formula. Okay. If a day if a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day, okay. well how 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 many how long have I been alive on this earth in God time, you know, stuff like that. Um and I had determined using that spreadsheet um that where there's it, it speaks in Revelation elsewhere about uh there's silence in heaven at the space of a half hour, I'm going, okay, well, they're in heaven. So is the half hour God time or human time? And if it's God time, uh, I forget what it came out to exactly, but I believe it was about 21 years is, okay. what, uh, is what a half hour in God time would equate to. And so if that, again, I don't remember the exact numbers, but if that's true, could it be talking about, if we're on God time, could it be talking about a period of about 42 years that... Um, some of this is taking place. Hmm. Like I sure the, hope the, not, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if 
if that's well, true, well, that goes back to some of my theories regarding, yeah. like, uh, for instance, the time of Jacob's trouble, which, again, nothing's written in a void. So when somebody throws out a, a, a reference to the time of Jacob's trouble, well, what was the time of Jacob's trouble? Well, Genesis tells you quite clearly that the time of Jacob's trouble lasted 20 years. And um, in incidentally, it started when Jacob started acting like Esau. When he mm -hmm. pretended to be Esau, and he was deception, he was uh, operating in deception. And so, it, it, again, if that's a formula, if the time of Jacob's trouble actually begins when Israel, who is Jacob, is acting like Esau instead of acting like uh, you know the, the promised seed, and, and that time period of his trouble was 20 years. When he took off after that deception, he took off for Uncle Laban's house and had to deal with all kinds of issues there. And he talks about it as his time of affliction being 20 years. So uh, if the time of Jacob's trouble is 20 years, then is it unreasonable to believe that this time that these kings are ruling for one hour in God time could in fact be uh, f double that, 40, okay. you know, 42 Here, years? Here's my, here's, my, uh, <laughs> here's my response to that. Uh, nice theory. <laughs> I, don't, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. First okay, of all, so it's, it says that... Uh, it's in, in God. You're right. God time uh, refers solely to God. It does not refer to the angels. I think one of the the biggest misnomers out there is that God created the angels outside of time, and that somehow we're going to live outside of time. Uh, I think that's complete nonsense. Uh, anybody who has a birthday lives in time. Uh, that goes for Satan, Michael, Gabriel, all the angels. They have a birthday. I can, it's Psalm 148. says that God uh, commanded and they were created. So That would you know, be God time, though. Well, no, only God exists in God time. All right? Only uh, God exists in God time. Oh, because, okay. Based well, on because, what? Book, book, chapter, verse. If you're going <laughs> to... <laughs> let's go. Book, chapter, right. verse on that. All right, all right. Uh, Second Peter... Chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, uh, looking there at verse um, 8. Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the, Lord, with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. Also, parallel passage, here's your witness, Psalm 90 verse 4. It says, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past and like a watch in the night. All right. So, look, this is talking about God's perspective. Where's it's not God? saying where's God in your sight. Yeah, your but, sight. But, but but where is he? He's in heaven. Well, yeah, but but heaven is I mean but so what? It, it, it doesn't oh, matter. Oh, okay. I mean, All right, doesn't matter. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter. It's not it's not it's not where God is that matters. Okay. Well, I mean, is it, does it matter if you were on Earth? You well, think I mean, if you're writing from it? if you're writing from a perspective, then your location, I oh, would think. Oh, come on, he's God. Matter. He's where is he? He's oh, outside okay. of time. He, That's where he is. He, he, God's where everywhere. He is. I mean, we could say okay. God. All right. God is so, everywhere. All right. But so where's his throne? His to... throne is in heaven. I mean, okay, uh, really? I we're gonna <laughs> are we gonna but really go there? So what if when his throne is on the Earth, you think it's gonna make it somehow different? Well, I no, no, no. I think. I think the day of the Lord is two things. I think it is a physical 24-hour time period where he pours out his wrath, but I think that physical 24-hour time period is the beginning, which starts in darkness, of the day of the Lord, which is a thousand years. Is it just a coincidence that you know a, a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day, and the day of the Lord happens to be a millennial reign that lasts a thousand years? No, I don't think that's just a coincidence. I think that's... I think that's a well-established precedence that a day with the Lord, and this would be the seventh God day in human existence, uh, you know, the 7,000th year, uh, or, or seven, a period of the last thousand years is the 7,000 time period. Yeah, uh, I, I get that. I get that. And I, I, I know so where his, you're going with his that. It's day. A, right. For God. For God, okay. Well, but so, John is in God's realm here. He's been taken up to the heaven. And... Right, but he still exists in time. I mean, well, look, he, I can, I can show you. He's taken up in spirit. spirit. Okay, right you know, I, I was in the Lord. I, I was in the spirit on the Lord's right. day, and he was taken up. And so, <laughs> he, he's 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 looking at the movie screens that we've talked about so many times in the heavenly control room. 
uh, so now he's on God time. Okay, well, look, in that same God place, Revelation 22, <laughs> it says, In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. All right? So there you have it. Uh, time never goes away. I mean, again, there's this oh, idea... I, I'm that, not disputing that. I'm just saying okay. the time is, is elongated in heaven versus what it is here. Well, I don't think or, it's or, 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 or maybe the other way around. I forget. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's well, elongated yeah. here compared to what it is there. Yeah, but this is this is now in the New Jerusalem. This is um, it's not in heaven anymore. This is the 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 city has gone down to planet Earth. Right? Sure, so but, you still but have when it comes moon to, cycles. When, you still got the sun. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But when New yeah. Jerusalem comes down to Earth, it's on the. I mean, time on Earth is reckoned by this rotation of the of the Earth and its movement around the Sun, etc. So New Jerusalem leaves the heavenly realm and enters our realm and is now on our time. So when it's talking about month to month, it's Earth month to month because where where is this location? It's on Earth. Right. So. If the place where time was weird is now gone, then I don't know. Just the, place, the whole concept. The place time is weird. <laughs> it just <laughs> no. I I think if you know from, from because God is who He is. He does not change. He's you know altogether different and and superior to us. I mean infinitely. Uh, time is, is you know how He reckons time. Fine. It can do whatever you want to say. It's fine with me. But, <laughs> it's not what know, I say. But, I'm, I'm telling you what the Bible says. Okay, well, I, I know I, I, we just read it, and I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. The way that God <laughs> reckons time is, fun, is different. But okay. let's talk about an angel, because they exist in that same realm as God, yes? Well, yeah, they do, and okay. they also come here. So when they're okay. here, they're operating on, you know, <laughs> their watch has to go on human time. When they're up there, they're on God time. Okay, now I want a chapter and verse for that. Well, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand for years is a day. It's, for it the repeat. Lord, right. Well, it, Lord, where is the Lord? His throne is where? It doesn't it, matter right now, where he is. He, you need to say it, he's it, everywhere. His time is dependent on location. Oh, this is good. I'm glad we're disagreeing about something. <laughs> well, yeah, it makes the show that much more interesting. <laughs> it, was getting too much, it was getting too boring, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, look, when I was a kid, uh, and we were, we were discussing these things in school, and the problem of space travel, uh, even if you're traveling at the speed of light, uh, you know, 186,282 miles per second, going to the nearest star four light years away, uh, if you were traveling at the speed of light, you could get to that star in four years and it'd be an eight-year round trip. Okay, great for you. It, you have aged eight years, and I forget what the what it came out to, but I did the longhand math on it, like in seventh or eighth grade. Uh, Earth is several thousand years older. Mm -hmm. So time is reckoned by your location uh, and speed and other things like that. So, you know, for the space traveler going 186,282 miles per second, you age eight years, but everybody else that you knew on Earth is long dead for thousands of years. So clearly time is, is attached to location. And I, 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 I'm cool with you on that. I really am. I, I, um, I'm familiar with the work of Dr. Russell Humphreys. He has talked about um, goodness, what's the name of his book? Uh, well, that's killing me now. Uh, time, what is it, Time and Space or something like that. Uh, he talks about the how time is different in a, in a gravity well. So the closer you get to the center of gravity, the slower it goes. All right, but, but of course now we're suggesting, now we're wondering if that kind of gravity principle is going to have any effect uh, to someone who is not bound by the gravity of Earth. I mean, now because, you know, certainly God is the center of all things. I mean, you know, now we're kind of getting beyond what the Scripture says. <laughs> we're getting yeah. beyond. We're, we're in Proxima Centauri now. <laughs> Ooh, I know. Yeah, so, all right, we'll, we'll have to just leave that. But all right. I, I think, I guess <laughs> we're, fair we're, enough. we're agreed that time never stops. Yes, are we agreed on yeah, that? Yeah, for sure. Oh, okay. I, I, Time never stops, okay. it's just reckoned differently. In, and, and it did have a beginning, and, and you know, I mean, the point I want to make is that the angels are not created in some timeless place, but the moment right. they were created, the moment God created anything, whether they were first or they were second, but the moment he created something, time began. Okay, Before he created anything, there was no time, because it was only God all by himself, in, in yeah. and of his own dimension. 
But the yeah. moment he's, he brought something into existence, that's when the clock started. Because mm -hmm. everything has a birthday. So Satan and all the angels are celebrating their 6,000th birthday. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if that's... Well, heaven itself has a birthday for that. Exactly. Matter. You know, and if that's only six days on God's calendar, that's fine. I'm cool with that. <laughs> you know, but, um, but, you know, all the angels, everything that's not God, which is, you know, everything else, uh, has a birthday. So, all right. Okay. Good. All right. Well, well, we, we're great. We're I don't great. know if we, are, we got anywhere with it. <laughs> all right. Yeah, Verse 11. Fun. Uh, behold, I'm coming quickly. Now, you know, the, uh, the prevalence of this verse... <laughs> See, verse, behold, I'm coming quickly. Here we are 2,000 years later. I know. So I know. Whose, clock are, whose clock are we on when it comes to quickly? <laughs> Dude, I agree with you when it comes to God. I, <laughs> I, never said I, didn't, I didn't agree with you there. Okay. I agree with you there. For God, <laughs> for God, it's no big deal. But I don't think that we can extrapolate that it's the same for us, you know, that we can... Anyway, let's, we'll we'll go on here. But well, if God says, "Hey, hang on, I'll be back in a minute." <laughs> well, yeah, but thankfully well, He didn't say a minute. <laughs> yeah, well, but you know, it's a hypothetical. Yeah. Anyway, well, you know, right. but but it is interesting. This word here, tahu in Greek, uh, it doesn't mean soon. First of all, hmm. it means it means quickly. All right. Now, yeah, it's in speed. Like exactly. Not, not, as, not as in time, but as in speed. Right. You know, if you if you. Uh, you know, you agree to meet somebody, and uh, they don't show up for a while. And you say, "Hey, where are you?" And they they text back and say, uh, "I'm coming soon." And you you think, "Okay, they're gonna walk out their door any second. And now I don't know. Maybe they're taking a horse, and they might come slowly, <laughs> but right. they're, but they're leaving really soon. Okay. Uh, yeah. Versus, you know, this is the classic case of the hare and the tortoise, right? Uh, you know, the the tortoise went soon, and the hare went quickly. Right, yeah. and, and, the, and the tortoise won because he went soon. He went right away, and he just kept on going, even though he was traveling slowly. Uh, and and the, the hare thought that he could win because he could travel quickly. So, you know, I just want to point that out for any preterists out there that are watching this. Uh, <laughs> if you are, let us know. We want to want, want to know why you're watching. Uh, but, uh, um, yeah. but you know, why are you uh, watching? If you think we're lying heretics, why do you spend all your time watching us? That I know, says something I, more about you than it does us. Exactly. <laughs> There's probably nobody out there. But, yeah, well. um, but this word tahu, it means quickly. So it, it refers to the manner in which that Jesus is going to come. Not in, not in, in you know, how soon he's going to, you know, he leaves the front door, basically. Yeah, so when he, when he finally does come... It's going to be a, a, a very fast. He will just boom. There he is. You yeah. Know, that's... Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Very good. All right. Verse twelve. Uh, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Now this one is really exciting, because mm. there is a temple of God in the New Jerusalem right now, and uh, it's later going to be removed because we see in Revelation twenty one, John says that I looked and there was no temple. In the city, but uh, right now there is a temple in the city. So what's up with that? Uh, yeah. We we find this temple in a number of places. Uh, you you have it, of course, in Isaiah chapter six, where Isaiah is transported in his vision. He sees God high and lifted up. The train of his robe fills the temple, right? And there's an altar there, and an angel takes some tongs and he gets a coal and touches it to his mouth. Uh, the same temple is that the one that Jesus went into, that is the one not of his creation, not made with human hands, and he takes his own blood into that temple, the one in heaven, and he, he offers it on the altar. And then you have these passages here in Revelation, talking about the temple of God in heaven. Uh, obviously Revelation 3.12 being the first one of those. Uh, and then we find this temple uh, sprinkled throughout the rest of the uh, book of Revelation, uh, talking about how no one could go into the temple uh, until all the uh, all the uh, vials, were, uh, or the, the plagues of God were fulfilled there in Revelation 15. Um, and uh, then it says that the temple of God in heaven was opened. Uh, so we, we again, we, we see this in a lot of places in the book of Revelation. The temple of God in heaven was opened. And that is our, our really big clue that this temple of God in uh, heaven 
is right now closed. Mm -hmm. It's closed. You cannot go into it. Un uh, well, it doesn't seem that anybody is, is allowed to go into this temple uh, because uh, it's, it's not possible uh, until all the wrath of God is actually poured out. And uh, I just want to point out um, a really good verse on this, which is uh, 15.8. It says, The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of his power, and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. So, uh, you know, nobody can go in because of all the thunder and lightning. Uh, we have also Revelation 11:19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake and great hail. So, this this temple of God in heaven is going to open at the second coming of Jesus. That's why it's incredibly important that we understand that the book of Revelation is not written chronologically, but it's written thematically. Again, we, it's, it's, it contains themes. Uh, we, we take these absolutely literally, of course, but it's not written you know, A, B, C, D, and E, but it's more like A and E go together, and then B and F go together, you know, and on down the line. So when we get to Revelation chapter 11, for example, we've now come again to the very tail end of the tribulation. This is, you know, we're now in the second coming phase uh, of this story. And then as the book goes on, we're going to sort of go back and look at other, other uh, snippets or, or camera angles as we've talked about. And then we'll come up to the end again, and then we'll come back. And we'll go back up to the end and come back until we finally get to the end of the book. But the, the temple of God in heaven is there. Uh, God has placed himself in this temple. He, uh, you know, nobody can come out until the plagues are, are complete. And notice that, um, that there's lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. But we find that same description in Revelation 16:21, and great hail fell from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. So when that, that temple is opened, all this crazy stuff comes out. The earth begins to just, uh, you know, it just begins to to totter like a hut and to stagger like a drunkard. I mean, just you know, think of a drunk guy and like, oh my goodness. And this is what the earth is going to do. All the islands and the mountains are going to flee out of their place. Uh, it's going to be a radical time. This is the same uh, same time frame as when the, uh, the the heavens are going to pass away and they're going to roll up like a scroll. This is the same period uh, that we have here. So, well, it, uh, go ahead. I, I, I finish your thought. I don't want to derail okay. you. Okay. Well, the, the temple of God is in the New Jerusalem right now. It's currently closed. God's fiery lightning presence is contained in there. At the second coming of Jesus, it's going to be opened. And then when John sees the city coming down in Revelation 21, he says that there was no temple. Because now all the wrath, etc., has been poured out. All of the... Um, well, the, the heaven and earth have now been reconciled, and, of course, God's fiery lightning presence and the creation have been reconciled, so there's no more need to contain him. And, now, there will be a, a temple on planet earth, but there will no, be, no, no longer be a temple in the New Jerusalem itself. Go ahead. Um when it was talking about that I will make you a, uh, in verse 12, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. Uh, I'm going to put up a, the screen here again. I'm wondering if that's talking about, or if the, again, if it's not written in a void, if that's doesn't have something to do with the pillar uh, that we see, uh, two pillars, in First Kings chapter 7, verses 15 through 22. And he cast two pillars of bronze, each one, 18 cubits high and a line of 12 cubits measured the circumference of each and goes on and tells 
us in um, verse 21. Then he set up the pillars by the vestibule of the temple. He set up the pillar on the right and called its name Jachin, and he set up the pillar on the left and called its name Boaz. Uh, do you think that Revelation uh, 3, verse uh, 12, is a callback to that in some, in some fashion? If, if, we, if we talk about the pillars, and I will make him a pillar in the temple, well, we've got an example of the pillars, two of them, of the temple in 1 Kings chapter 7. And so have you given any thought to the Jacob and Boaz angle? And the reason I'm asking this is because uh, Freemasons in the occult are obsessed with that. And so anytime I see the occult doing something, I know that that's a counterfeit. I'm like, okay, why are they obsessed with this? Why are they all about Jacob and Boaz? And why, you know, they always got the, the, the Masonic apron with the two pillars there. Um, if that's a counterfeit, what's the real? And regarding the real, do you think there's a tie-in in Revelation 3 to 1 Kings 7? I think it's possible, of course. Uh, I'm not able to say 100%. I, I'm just not sure, but... Um, um, yeah, I guess, you know. Something guess, to look into. I, yeah, I, I well, made a note for myself. I'm yeah. like, hmm, that's awfully curious. Yeah, there's, probably no, that's, some, there's something there. I don't, you know, I don't know what it is. but. Yeah, well, it is. Uh, you know, and, of course, I guess, you know, the, the bigger question then becomes if the temple is going to be removed from the new Jerusalem, uh, What's the where, point will of these guys, well, where will these guys be pillars, you know? Um, yeah, I, that, that's a great question. And and well, my my stance is that the the temple is actually going to move, um, and I don't think that's so fantastic. I mean, we move buildings all the time. In fact, where do you move, think it's moving to? I think it's moving to planet Earth. Well, I mean, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Well, but if you know, it's moving to planet Earth, but New Jerusalem is moving to planet Earth, so you're saying the temple is removed from the New Jerusalem. Yes. So where would it be moved to? If well, I mean, what's the point of being made a pillar in the temple if the temple is going to be tossed out. So is it just moving location or is it being tossed out altogether? Well, uh, I think the temple itself is um, the temple itself is going to move down to the ground level. You know, even though the, the New Jerusalem is going to be on planet Earth, but it, this temple will no, won't be in the, the New Jerusalem proper. It'll be just outside the gates hmm. somewhere. And, um, you know, so one option is that uh, he will somehow, these people, these overcomers, will serve in that temple. That's one possibility. Well, yeah, because during the millennial reign, there's still sacrifices going exactly. on. Exactly, yeah. So you can't do the sacrifices without a temple, so it's... Right. You know, so somehow they'll be involved with that. And the name of God and the name of the city, the New Jerusalem, will be put on this person. Right, so you know now this is a, a an immortal. He's he has some kind of a function in the temple of God. We're not told what he's going to do. Uh, I mean, is he just a doorkeeper? Who knows? We don't know. But uh, he's going to have a, a pretty important job. I don't think that that means that they have to stand there stiff for the rest of eternity. <laughs> Gee, I wish I had gotten this post. Thanks a lot. I'm a, Lord. I'm a pillar. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. This is great. You know. Uh, I, I don't. I don't imagine it to be that way. Uh, I would. Uh, I you know. I would. I, you know. Pillar. Um, you know. What's happening with this idea of a pillar? Are they? Uh, are they just you know, like a pillar of the community? That kind of a pillar? Or are they actually well, holding up the roof? You know. No. The reason I think it's a physical pillar is because it also says in verse twelve, "I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more." And then it says, "I will write on him the name of my God." And the name of the city of my God. So you got two names there. Mm. And in First Kings uh, seven, you've got two names there. Yeah. This is, and I'm going to name one Jacob and the other Boaz. So you know, apparently these these new pillars are not going to be Jacob and Boaz, which I'm sure there's a significance to that too. You know, for a time, that was the name of those two pillars. Those two pillars are getting a new name, uh, which is not given to us here uh, in Revelation three. Mm. Interesting. Well, you know, we, I guess we just don't know. Uh, that's probably the, what we'll have to admit here. We don't know uh, ultimately what that means. And, and I guess, you know, if, if God makes you a pillar in the temple, then that must be a pretty good gig, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I've never been there. I don't know what it looks like, so I can't really comment on how fun that's going to be. But, uh, but well, if God uh, thinks it's good, then it must be good. 
that may be a, a good point for us to end this episode on and just uh, say to our viewers, if you've got an idea and you think you understand what's going on here, we'd love to hear from you. Go to uh, Facebook and go to our Quest for Truth page. It's facebook.com forward slash Quest for Truth show. And um, post your comments there. We'd love to uh, hear your insights. Perfect, yeah. Yeah, thank you for joining us, everyone. We want to encourage you to stay in the Word, keep on that quest for truth. God's Word is amazing. Until next week. Yes. <laughs>